And this team has come here, so they will do some more presentation, have more slides, and they will help us to pass more uh, coming into the top thought process and how we need to move forward. And uh, and then we have a couple of workshops. Brian, thank you. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm breathing really heavily into the microphone. Um, so thank you, Abhishek. It's really a pleasure to be here. Abhishek has been. Uh, I, you probably know better than I this tireless advocate for using digital uh, to enhance what we do and find new ways to develop uh, uh, pathways to actually positive affect positive changes in food and farming systems around the world. So thank you, Abby, for for having us. Um, one of the things I find when I visit centers is it's it's helpful or people find helpful is to just give a quick overview of what the big data platform is. Um, and, and ways in which centers can, can engage with that. And so I want to take maybe 15 minutes, hopefully tops, um, to, to sort of spin through that. And then we'll get a bit more of an overview of what will be happening over the next few days from, from Hans uh, with the Accenture Development Partnerships team. And so uh, the big data platform, oh, that's me, oh, good. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the big data platform, uh, you know, we're looking at ways and we can actually mobilize the data that we have and find new ways to, to generate impacts. Um, uh, you know, we like to say it's harnessing the capabilities of data to accelerate and enhance the impact of the research that we do across, um, across our organization. We're organized into three modules. We call them Organize, Convene, and Inspire. Uh, organize is about uh, data sharing, data standardization, uh, adoption and use of common metadata schema and examining ways in which the data that we're generating can be turned into new organizational capabilities that will help us to advance our mission. Um, uh, Convene is about partnerships and aligning public and private and nonprofit um, sort of goods around the changes that we'd like to see in food and farming systems around the world. And Inspire is an innovation process that we run um, that's open right now, in fact, so I want to make a, a bit of publicity for that. So I'll, qu I'll quickly spin through a few, some of the, the things that are going on under these uh, uh, modules, and um, certainly, you know, feel free to stop me and we can, we can talk about them uh, a little bit more detail if you like. So there's sort of one of the banner, oops, maybe someone's calling me or something. Someone's calling someone else? Here, just in case. Yeah. So we have um, one of the banner investments under the first um, uh, module organized is called the, uh, the Global Agricultural Data Innovation and Acceleration Network Guardian. And this is a pan-CGIR data indexer. It's not a harvester. All the data resides where it resides. But um, across the 11 gene banks, across the 15 centers, um, uh, across uh, publication repositories and data repositories, um, this uh, keyword searchable tool enables uh, folks who want to explore CGIR data, uh, data sets and publications to, to go and to do so. There are about 900 and some ICRSAT data sets in there presently. There are about 200 and, no, some 900 and some ICRSAT publications, about 225 data sets from ICRSAT, uh, um, about two thirds of those um, over the last couple of years um, when, um, you know, we've been working directly with centers to, to sort of help with mobilizing those data. Um, the other, so through there, you can actually start to see, this is a bit dated, it's using the spatial production allocation um, model out of IFPRI to start to see spatially where uh, these crop production data are going. Progressively, we're able to sort of provide some, really at this stage, I think, models of what semantic enabled data should enable us to do and when we actually are able to query data across multiple centers. Uh, another thing that we developed under this, which I think we'll be able to sort of make it ready for prime time pretty soon, is a, a system we're calling Find an Expert, where we took, um, uh, took the active email directory, so anybody with a cgir.org or eerie.org email address, and the pub public, you know, publication history and an ontology of researchers, and it enables us to develop uh, profiles uh, of active CGIR 
researchers, people who are with the organization at any given time or at least have an active email address. Uh, we can automatically generate a profile of those folks um, and we can see who they're publishing with. Uh, with some lag, obviously, at the publication history, but I think that's a pretty good indicator of who's collaborating with whom across our organization and even within our organization and outside of our organization. And so I think for the first time we can have easy discoverability cutting across all of the data types uh, in our organization and we can have um, really interesting visibility on the expertise we have uh, in the organization. Uh, there's one tool that I didn't get a chance to mention, the agronomy field it didn't make it in here either. Agronomy Field Information Management System, which I think Abhi, we're looking at a field test of this in the coming year, right? So this is a system that will take the reference data ontologies and vocabularies and help populate electronic field books when research is being conducted. And it bridges agronomy and, and breeding um, uh, use cases. And so any of the electronic data collection tools of reference out there could use, you could use ODK. There's, there's a KD Smart, the one that happens in the kind of more breeding space. Basically, it can sit behind any of those different tools and enable uh, researchers to use reference ontologies and reference vocabularies from the point of conducting research. And so it's sort of data interoperability uh, from the source or from the beginning. So Convene, as I said, is about partnerships. And what I like to say is that this is where we try to align public, private, and nonprofit goods or actions around the changes that we'd like to see in food and farming systems. Um, this is just a network map of, of members of communities of practice um, uh, uh, and, um, and participants in our, in our big data convention. Um, so trying to actually explicitly look to build those those, that partnership network and those collaborations. Under this module, we have some shared services. Uh, GBDX is um, commercial satellite imagery, very high resolution commercial satellite imagery from the private company Digital Globe. We have a research subscription. Uh, my understanding is that there are several very active users at ICRASAT of this service. Um, IBM, uh, the weather company, is providing us uh, clean historical weather data, validated weather data back to 1979 on a global grid, 30-kilometer uh, grid. Uh, Globus, this is uh, AWARE, which I, which I think you guys know, and there are a few users of AWARE here at ICRASAT. And then this other one, Globus, is um, very interesting. It is, um, comes from the grid community, grid computing community, which is kind of a way of dividing up very large compute jobs across multiple institutions. And um, it's software that just mediates this kind of grid computing. And so I really like this graphic for showing what Globus can help us to do, where anybody who's holding data, say on a, a, a laptop or something, uh, or it could be actually in a, you know, a data center at, a, at an institution, um, can do what they call to designate a Globus endpoint. They can actually... Uh, set permissions of who they want to share data with, um, and then uh, if, if somebody who's got the appropriate permissions wants requests that data, Globus will manage the transfer uh, from one endpoint to another endpoint. Um, endpoints can also be um, high-performance computing systems, and so we could use it for uh, sharing storage. We could use it for sharing computational power. Um, entirely sort of, you know, horizontally um, as, a, as a sort of you know, uh, uh, interim step. I think, I think the overall understanding is that migrating to the cloud ultimately should be cheaper, but the reality is that, you know, we don't necessarily always have the budgets to do that, and so we could actually start using the resources we have a bit more efficiently in terms of um, data storage and, and computation. Uh, we just integrated this, and it took months, and I didn't, wasn't expecting this, but just in the last week we were able to go to production where Globus and the active email directory of CGIR are integrated. And so anybody with an active CGIR.org or eerie.org email address can make use of this service. And um, we've got somebody part-time uh, through through SIAT whose job is, in, well, for us anyway, is to be available to help people get set up using Globus if they, if they wish to use it for their own research collaborations. And what in the roadmap for Guardian, the system I showed for data discovery, 
uh, is to integrate with Globus. And so if you have data that's not quite ready to be fully open, you could publish the metadata uh, in Guardian. It would be discoverable by your colleagues. And then Globus could for sort of function on the back end of like, you know, if you have the right to access that data, it will, it will validate and authenticate that and then help with managing the transfer um, if you wish to be, you know, facilitating sharing data. Um, so uh, lastly, on Convene, we run a global convention. I like to think it's becoming a very good technical reference in this, you know, what needs to happen with digital agriculture sort of really. Um, and in fact, uh, this coming October, it will be hosted here at the ICRASAT campus. And uh, so we'll, we're sort of here start trying to start putting things into place for that. Um, we promote it really heavily. We look at it as a partnership development opportunity. So we actually look for majority non-CGIAR participants. We look for public, private, nonprofit. Um, last year we had, I think it was 2,500 really active remote participants. We had about 350 or so uh, in-person participants. We promote so actively we were, that we were the biggest thing on Kenyan Twitter uh, for two straight days. Uh, there was somebody called Big Data Batman that was like obsessed with us and was following us. And, um, and then suddenly we got bumped out because Melania Trump visited Kenya like the next day and so we couldn't compete. But um, you know, it's like ways, new ways of engaging with the wider partnership community. Um, several of the folks who came to that convention had never heard of CGIR before. They didn't know that we existed as a resource. They didn't know that we have the deep subject matter expertise that we have. And so I think it, it shows that there's, there's a real opportunity to, to sort of show up to this digital agriculture space um, in new ways and build new partnerships. Uh, there are six communities of practice under uh, Convene. Um, with the, in the geospatial data community of practice, there are some very active users here um, using that uh, uh, satellite imagery uh, that I mentioned about and also some of the weather data. Uh, there's a mini grant under the crop modeling, uh, specifically using AppSim, I think, for trying to predict some G by E by M interactions kind of across a larger scale. Um, and those who work on that can give us more details about that. Um, uh, Abi Shek is a very active participant in the ontologies uh, community of practice, and in fact, next year we'll be back and we'll be we'll be uh, co-producing with ICRASAT uh, one of the events that's kind of a reference for uh, data ontologies in this food security space called Pheno Harmonis. Uh, and then I think there are about twelve ICRASAT members, if I remember correctly, uh, in the socioeconomic data community of practice. So, Inspire. This is our innovation process. Uh, we're doing it very specifically to try to find ways in which our research can go and find new ways of affecting positive changes in food and farming systems. So it's not a process built around uh, continuing to conduct research that we already conduct. It's about finding ways in which the research that we conduct and the subject matter expertise we have can go and sort of find new ways to affect positive changes. Uh, we've got four categories this year. Uh, Data-driven farming, monitoring pests and diseases, revealing food systems, and one we're calling sensing and renewing uh, ecosystems. And you can you know, read a bit more about what these are. Like I said, it's open right now. What we're looking for, these are sort of you know, responsive proposals, you know, proposals that, that um, we'll sort of get, you know, trying to get some water, we'll sort of uh, get through the gate um, they need to reflect meaningful collaboration between CGIR researchers aligned with CRPs and a non-CG partner of any type. It can be, we've had governments, we've had large IT firms, we've had startups, we've had other research institutes. It doesn't really matter. It just has to be a non-CG partner of some type. And what we're looking for is where those two partners have come together and they've used the, cap used the capabilities they have to try to create something new. So it's more than just like the sum of the parts. It's, it's something we haven't seen before, ideally. Um, the innovativeness or newness of it, I mean, these are, you know, we'd, we have about six people, five or six people that just evaluate 
how meaningful the collaboration looks, how new the thing itself looks. So there's always a bit of subjectivity, but hopefully it will kind of, you know, even itself out. And then, uh, you know, so the innovativeness or innovation, and then data mobilization. How is data being used? Hopefully CGIR data, and over time, hopefully CGIR data that can be sourced uh, through Guardian that we mentioned a little bit earlier. Then it goes to primar that it goes to um, a judging panel that is external. Uh, save one or two people that actually know the CG context. Uh, usually we have six or seven judges, sometimes more. I think last year we had eight. And then they, they do basically scoring. Potential for scale, is it novel use, oops. <laughs> that was like something cycling back to, oh yeah. Um, uh, potential for sustainability, potential for impact, uh, the newness bit, and then actually at the convention is where um, uh, finalists will make their presentation and have a chance over a few course of a few days to interact with each other, interact with just people <sighs> at the convention, and uh, the convention culminates with uh, decisions of, of awards. Um, I think we're onto something in terms of this, you know, linking up CGIR researchers who, you know, we, we understand how to do study designs, we know what evidence is. Um, and the startup space is kind of does not typically. <laughs> um, and so I think we're onto something in terms of trying to understand more like where are useful innovations in this digital agriculture space and where their potential for impact is. So uh, three examples and I think we'll, we'll be done. So uh, this one, this particular uh, example, these are three examples that went to the next stage and got a bit of scale up funds because they they did a full year of implementation at a startup phase. They measured some things, and then they made the case that they had the potential to go to larger scale. Um, so this project, Seeing is Believing, led by IFPRI uh, with Kabi, uh, actually integrated uh, cell phone camera images. So you see a farmer there like taking a picture of the field. Um, that at a predefined position and, um, and, and timing, um, across uh, several thousand farmers, basically they were able to use those images to, de 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 to detect and predict crop growth stage, and then to be able to sort of feed in advisory messages. Um, all of this within the context of an information, sorry, uh, insurance product um, that was making use of this information about um, crop growth stage, trying to understand some stuff about crop health, and also being able to know, now that they know crop health stage and what the farmer is growing because they're already clients of the insurance product, to kind of integrate that information into how the product worked. They did a, a randomized control trial and, and, and found that um, there was actually greater uh, customer willingness to pay for the insurance and that the, the adoption and use of these advisory messages um, were, were positively affected as well and is sort of as part of that, that package. Um, uh, Marple, this is really interesting to me in that they took a small in-field gene sequencing device that was used in Ebola diagnosis and response, and they tested it out to see if they could use it for in-field diagnosis of uh, wheat rust. And um, they did test it, and they found that it would work for that, and they reduced the response time for di diagnosis and response to something like under a couple of days where in comparison to making cuts and you know sending samples off to a lab somewhere and hearing back. And then this last one here, this is a, uh, a group, there's a group called uh, Farm Africa Farmers Club. It's a Facebook group. Um, at the time we, we started working with them, they had 120,000 members. Now they've got like 230,000 members, and that's entirely horizontal communications between farmers. Just exchanging images, telling things about farming to each other, basically. Um, and you could actually go and look and see, you know, people exchanging um, these messages with each other. What, um, what's really interesting, one of the things that's really interesting to me is that um, uh, they're, they're speaking or they're communicating with each other in a mix of um, English, English and Swahili. So, so for example, I wouldn't really get fully what was going on in that uh, community. And so specifically what this project did was connect ILRI researchers into that community 
and they could go and they could, and specifically looking at um, animal health and dairy, um, and they could go and they could sort of tag images, and they could, you know, surmise what they thought they saw in the image in terms of what was happening with a particular milk cow. Um, and so they, they were able to do a survey with among these uh, participants, and of those within that survey of that, like they found that they estimate 92% of the participants in that community had changed some farming practice as a result of something they had learned in that community. And so it's a really interesting example of trying to interact with farmers at scale, but in a way that um, you know, is, is much more sort of horizontal and helps kind of help us as researchers be part of that farmer to farmer um, exchange. And so, I mean, here are, so we talked about the Inspire Challenge as our innovation process. It's open right now. Um, you know a little bit about the, some of the criteria. Um, uh, we talked about Guardian, oops. Talked about Guardian. Uh, we've got the convention that's coming up and we have these communities of practice. And so, uh, you know, I think that between these four kind of banner uh, aspects of the program, we're starting to uh, address some of the kind of you know, binding issues or areas where more evidence is needed or where more coordination is needed to really kind of capture this digital agriculture space and help shape it uh, in ways that um, that will, will help affect uh, changes in food and farming systems. So that was a little over 15. Um, so that's the big data platform. And I'm here for till through the end of the week and happy to, to discuss any um, aspect of this. So digital strategy. Um, as uh, Abby mentioned, uh, last year at one point um, we thought it would be interesting and our steering committee sort of agreed with us that we could sort of get a sense of what was happening with digital strategy across CGIR. And digital strategy, the, the sort of working definition is something along the lines of how are data and digital technologies being used or should be used in service of the mission of the organization and what's happening in the wider context in terms of use of data and digital technologies that we should you know, synergize with or differentiate ourselves from or, or take into account as we um, examine that question. And so uh, you know, we, we, the team visited multiple centers, including ICRASAT, made some observations. Um, and, and as Abby said, um, uh, 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 you know, ICRASAT took it very seriously and, um, and is in the process of, of developing uh, a digital strategy. And I think this will be the seventh center uh, that I visited specifically on this digital strategy effort. And um, from what I've seen so far, uh, this is the most flesh out, fleshed out digital strategy um, I've seen in all of those centers. So con congratulations to that, I guess. Or I mean, it's happy to see it matured uh, beyond uh, the majority, uh, pretty much all the centers I've been to. One, maybe they're there. I don't know. I can ask these guys what they think. Um, but um, so I'll hand it over to Hans to to talk a little bit more about digital strategy and the why and what we'll be uh, up to. Yeah. Unless you've got some comments or questions, uh, quick ones so we can... You want to? Uh, yeah. I guess I just go back in. Is that all right? Yeah. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Namaste. Um, we are um, Marijn, Hans, and and Meryl. We're a Dutch team. Um, we all work for Accenture, which is a very large consultancy uh, organization. And within Accenture, there's a very small part, which is a non-profit business in itself, which is called Accenture Development Partnerships. And we are here on behalf of Accenture Development Partnerships. And um, we work across international NGOs, donors, uh, also social enterprises, as long as at the end of the line, there's a social impact um, uh, by the clients that we work for. 
So I think the great thing about Accenture Development Partnerships is that it's a three-way investment model, meaning that Accenture waives all profits on all the projects. The project participants um, do this partially voluntary, so they take a salary cut to work for NGOs, to work for Accenture Development Partnerships, and there's a small part left for the client to pay. So everyone is invested in the projects that we're doing. Um, the topics that we handle are basically across the board everything that Accenture also does, but obviously uh, there's some more expertise around the international development sector, uh, fundraising, and everything that has to do with the impact on beneficiaries. That expertise sits within ADP. So we're very happy to be here, very excited to be here again, uh, and um, thanks to, to Abi for all the uh, preparation work for the warm welcome. So, so far so good. We're really looking forward to the next few days. So I'm here to tell you a bit about the project itself, the work that we're doing so far for the big data platform for CJIR, and to give you a first kind of taste of digital transformation, how we see digital transformation. Of course, that's up for discussion in the next few days. Yeah. So the CJIR project so far, um, what we're trying to do is together with the big data platform, support you in your digital transformation. And in this case, it's the first steps. So we need to assess where you are now and see uh, what kind of digital strategy you can apply to start a digital transformation or to become part of it. Oh, that's a double click. So we've visited centers uh, across the world so far. I think we, we visited 10, of which seven are specifically for the, the digital assessment. Uh, we just came back from EMI, Worldfish and Erie in uh, February and March, and now the second time here at, at DQSAT. So the, the projects that we're currently doing together with the Big Data Platform um, are the Big Data Platform Assessment, the Digital Transformation, and the Enterprise Architecture. The Big Data Platform Assessment is work that we did end of last year, which is basically looking at uh, the services that the Big Data Platform needs to create for the wider CGIAR. Uh, so that work is completed um, now, and that's the project where we're here for. We're doing the digital transformation work, which is an assessment of your digital readiness, and basically the first steps in seeing um, how we can start a digital transformation. And the third one is the enterprise architecture, which is an overview of all the domain process, processes, the center processes, and the capability model. Um, we will not do that work here. That's something we've done in the past few months, also with input from, uh, from ICRISAT. So the program for the, the next few days here, that's um, uh, consists out of three days. We're now in the opening seminar. Then today we have, I think, a number of interviews, six or seven interviews planned. Um, basically, we'll start asking around your digital strategy, uh, your digital operating model, everything around uh, what you're doing already around digital technologies. Um, then in the next, um, the next part in day two, we'll have a digital transformation workshop. So we'll do, we'll take a, lip, a bit more of a, of a creative approach to seeing where you are now, what kind of ideas you have to, uh, to move digital forward. Thanks very much. And um, in the afternoon, we'll also start with the digital infrastructure mapping, which is basically creating an overview of the data flow within your organization. Then on the, on the third day, we will continue doing that and we'll have a debrief with our um, conclusions so far. So on top of this, we really invite you to ask us everything you want to know around digital transformation, digital technologies, we're not only here to do this, but also to um, help you with everything you, you would like to know. If you have any questions you think Accenture could help you with, and we're happy to uh, provide you with some spot leadership or make the right connections. We're really here to kind of leverage that big Accentureship for whatever you, you want to learn in, in these three days. So um, then a little bit about digital transformation itself. Um, so there are a lot of, um, definitions out there on digital transformation. Um, we created this one, so this is the one that I think is most applicable also for this sector. It's the profound transformation 
of uh, organizational activities to fully leverage the chances and opportunities of digital technology and their impact on society. So there are a few important elements in there. Um, there's an element of change, there's an element of opportunity and an element of threat. I think the element of change is very important because it's something that's happening in society and uh, which will happen whether you jump on that train or not. Um, there's also the element of threat. If you're not doing that, you'll be behind. There's also an element of opportunity. There are loads of digital uh, technologies which now offer opportunities that have never been there before. So that's what we mean when we speak of the digital transformation. Now, um, digital disruption, um, it might be a bit of a, a buzzword, but it's very real. I think you recognize um, headlines in the media speaking of the fourth industrial re revolution and the impact of society. But it's also about the expectations that new consumers um, have, and these consumers are your employees, the researchers of the future, um, on how does an um, what does an employer do for me? What kind of services do I expect from wherever I am? A and also the disruptive impact of startups, but also larger organizations that leverage digital technology in, a, in, a, in the right way. So why, um, why is this important? So this is a bit of a dramatic slide. So wh why would you... Um, want to start with your digital transformation. So if you take a very um, factual look at um, the Fortune 500, I think 30% of what was in there in 2010 does not sit in the Fortune 500 anymore, which is just seven years, and it's one third of all companies. And the main reason behind that uh, is because they were lacking behind in their digital capabilities. So it's, a, it's an actual fact that if you don't start making the first steps in your digital transformation, you might, well, I won't say you become one of these, but um, you might like behind be uh, compared to your competitors. So you might ask, why is this now suddenly important and not 10 years ago or 10 years from now? Um, if we take a look at, well, there are many reasons, but I think one of the main reasons is the technology. So if we take a look at um, this list of, of very impactful technologies, we see that a lot of these are now mature enough to be used at scale by everyone. Now, it's actually funny because I, I used this slide before, and um, you see here the, the classification of what's in the lab, what's for early adopters, and what's now for everyone. And I was kind of drawing this line to the left and right, and now realizing almost everything that is on this list can currently be applied and leveraged by organizations. So it's that we're now able to do all of this and really make a different impact than we did before. So I think this is a really nice slide to kind of absorb and think to what extent Equisalt is already using this. Um, so what do we need to change? And I think this is an important, important slide because when we hear digital technologies or the word digital itself, um, we, we think sometimes too much about the technology part of it. But digital is not about just technology. It's about leveraging that to create new value propositions. So a society that is in a digital transformation requires different value propositions as before. It allows you to create new revenue streams that you did, could not think of before. It allows you to create new commercial models and also to form new partnerships to uh, bring in new knowledge or, or create those new value propositions. So it's not just about how can we implement the technology, but it's more about how can we leverage that for something that's really important. And a nice analogy to um, compare technology with, uh, with digital is driving a car. So I can drive a car. Uh, I, I think I can do that quite well. I know what I can do with a car. Um, so I can think about the possibilities I have with a car. I know nothing or not enough about technology in my car. So being digital is not knowing all these technologies uh, uh, as an expert that I just mentioned. It's about knowing enough to think about how we can leverage that for our organization to make a larger impact. Um, I wanted to share this, this video with you, which is an overview of um, Ignite examples from the World Economic Forum. 
And Accenture uh, did a lot of research, multiple research pieces, which I will talk about later, uh, with the World Economic Forum on uh, responsible digital transformation, uh, but also what are the key uh, factors for successful digital transformation, and also some agricultural research, actually. Um, first, I wanted to show this just to give you a taste of the possibilities and what's already out there. Do we have sound? We did have sound before. Yep, so obviously you cannot leave a comment because it was a movie made in preparation of the, the World Economic Forum. Let's not, uh, let's not do it again. So um, together with, uh, with the World Economic Forum, we, we, we took a look at the, the trends um, that we see within agriculture. So this is basically um, say, saying the same thing, but then specifically for your industry, saying there are loads of examples of how digital technologies are leveraged to make a bigger impact. So I, I, I hope uh, that you recognize some of these, these terms here, and if not, be inspired. Um, there's a research piece behind it, this, which I'm happy to share with you. The four main trends that they um, determined based on the research so far was precision agriculture, so the use of sensors to have higher yields to more precision farming, the connected supply chain, obviously using, for instance, technologies like um, blockchain, but also just simpler, uh, simpler data analysis to be to show more insight in a complete end-to-end -end supply chain and how to intervene. We have the digital marketplace, which brings demand and supply together and is more transparent for farmers how to sell their crops for a higher price. And autonomous operations, of course, has a huge impact by using more physical technologies to um, to do farming, but also applying sensors to that physical technology and collect more data. I think I lost my clicker. Thank you. So next to being leader of the big data platform, Brian does also uh, assist. You can hire him as assistant for presentation if you want to. So um, leveraging uh, new technologies, is, it's, it's not easy. And this comes a bit back to the point that I made earlier. Um, is that it's not just implementing technology. So what we've seen happening a lot is that we just reel in a new technology, implement it, it works, and then we tick the box saying it's successful. That's obviously not the case. When we do uh, technology implementations at commercial clients, the budget for the IT part of that project is as big as the change management part 
and the operational part of that project. So that's, that's really, really a big impact. So double everything that you think of you should invest in technology to make sure that your organization is ready and that it's applied to what I said earlier, that you think of a new service offering using digital. And based on that, you do a technology investment and not the other way around. So um, what's kind of getting in the way of um, growth through digital within organizations? And a lot of things, but I, I want to highlight four, which I think are really applicable, is that um, there's, like in this presentation, loads of examples, and then the question is where to start. And um, in a lot of cases, there's not really a framework on how we should invest in these technologies and what's important for us. It kind of links back to your digital strategy, so that's why that's so important. Um, successful silos, so what you see because of a lack of a digital strategy, there are separate pockets within the organization that start to do uh, their own initiatives who might be very successful but are not aligned by a wider digital strategy. Then the third one, beautiful but not bold, is that those initi initiatives might be successful, but do they really move the needle in a bigger scheme of things? Do they really um, impact the um, success that you have as an organization on a wider scale? Are you really tapping into a completely new market? Are you really changing completely your, your new business model? So not just an incremental change that makes you more efficient, but not just going from paper to email, but really thinking about how can we leverage the technology to do something completely new. Um, and then the fourth one is a, a whole new world, and that's coming back to the point saying, don't only bring in technology, but change the way you think about operations, change the way you think about doing your business. So it's really tapping all the, uh, ticking all the boxes of people, process, and technology. Um, this is the, the last part, it's enablers for success, and this, these are the enablers that we'll use in the upcoming three days to assess your digital readiness. Um, and this comes out of a research with the World Economic Forum and Accenture, where we interviewed uh, 16,000 um, organizations, organizations across the globe, and there were qualitative interviews with, I think, over 100 CEOs as an input for this research. Out of that, we've published these enablers, and um, there, there's a layer behind this. So these are the five main enablers. Uh, agile and digital savvy leadership, obviously focusing on the overall vision, but also how knowledgeable leadership is about digital, digital technologies. So not just only asking someone to do a digital strategy, but also um, making sure that you're aware of the technologies that are available so you can embed that in your strategic thinking. Forward-looking skills agenda is looking ahead, uh, thinking about the skills that become important in three or five years and investing in that, really making a strategy around that that's based on the digital technologies. Data and access management, if we do digital strategies for organizations, data and getting those basics in order is always on the roadmap. I'm not seeing one where that's not the case. It's a key part of being successful as an organization digital ecosystem thinking, and sorry for the use of the word ecosystem, um, it's just how, how the, the research has called that, that indicator. Um, so it, in this case, it just means an ecosystem of partners. So who are you partner, partnering with to create those new business models, to bring in new knowledge, to become more successful? And technology infrastructure readiness is the technology part of it. So to what extent is your architecture open to bringing in new technologies? How agile is it? Things like that. So those enablers will use in the next few days to do the interviews and also to do the workshop. We'll explain in the workshop the interviews a bit more around them. And uh, yeah, we'll guide you through it all the way. And with that, um, I'd like to open up the floor for any questions. I don't know how much time we have left. I, I didn't do a time check. Five minutes. All right. So we have five minutes for questions if you have any. Most uh, with their own proprietary frameworks to kind of understand the readiness of an organization and kind of help them chart a way forward to attain, attain that digital readiness. So would you have something from Accenture which we could probably reuse? 
Yeah, definitely. I have already also shared a few examples with uh, with Brian, and I think also that the big data platform has those those frameworks. Um, it's it's. I mean, there are different shapes and forms. You can think about an overview of uh, digital capabilities. So, do you want to have an analytics, a mobility, uh, a blockchain capability in house or not? Um, and that's that's for the technology side, but also think about service design. So, do you have someone that can create a proper user journey, can apply design thinking to the way that you're designing new processes and the way your operating model works? Does not just only bring those digital uh, technology capabilities in, but also how can we reshape our operating model to be best positioned. Uh, yeah, and I'm happy to, to share those with you. Um, I, I didn't want to bore, yeah. <laughs> bore you with it because it's, it's a lot of detail and a lot of different options. Um, but yeah, definitely happy to share those. Yeah, follow on question. So based on your experience, which not-for-profit or development organizations you think is really leveraged digital in a way, which could be like, you know, some kind of a reference for all of us to, you know, to look to? Um, very good question, and you're not the first one asking that question. I think there's not a, there, there's not a unicorn that does everything um, perfect. Obviously, you're always um, facing a legacy organization, right? I think a very challenging question that we'd like to ask everyone is, for instance, if you would get the opportunity to, to design a crystal now, you didn't have those buildings, you didn't have all these employees, what were the processes that you would design? Probably the first thing that you would not do is think, well, let's buy this huge building and hire all these employees. You would think about how can we do stuff in a digital way. So I, th I think a nice um, a nice uh, example is Give Direct. Uh, they are an NGO without any um, physical assets. Yeah, without any physical assets, without any Give offices, and do everything digital. They are very much disrupting the way that giving works at this moment. But they are an NGO who are doing um, uh, direct giving, so just cash grants in emergency situations without, not without any questions asked, but without a lot of questions asked. So they strip away all the, the, the projects, strip away all the thinking of, is this the right priority? You just go there, give money, and let people figure out if that's what to do with that money. So that's already, I think, quite innovative and a new way of thinking. But they also do that in a very digital way. So it's a, a nice example to look into. I'm going to ask Hans, I'm going to ask a question to Brian first. Brian, you know, big data platform, year three, uh, you're supporting the CGIR, so we're a billion dollar organisation. How much, what percentage are we on the way to be able to represent a billion dollar a year organisation in terms of our data management? Are we 5%? Are we 50% on the way to be able to represent that? that scale of organization. You mean that our, our data management has sort of turned the corner while we're really capturing the value of yeah. our data to, yeah. to deliver a on Yeah, a billion dollar investment so a forth? year. You know, big data yeah. platform is a platform across that billion dollars about trying to, mm -hmm. to mobilize the data and organize yeah. our data management. Yeah. How far along are we? I think we've just scratched the surface, honestly. And, and if we look at, so in Guardian, for example, that would be data sets where somebody's made a decision to make data fully open which is not appropriate for absolutely every type of data all the time, there are um, uh, just shy of 100,000 publications, and I think it's about 5,000 data sets currently across the whole of CJIR. And of, of course, that's just this tiny little fraction of the data that we generate, and, and certainly is, you know, the legacy data that we have is also quite, quite massive. And so um, I think in terms of, that as a metric, it shows that we've just scratched the surface. That said, I think that we are harmonizing around common metadata standards and we're starting to harmonize around these, these processes. And so um, I, th I could say, I'd like to ask that, look at that same question in two years and, and see how we've shifted. But I think it's safe to say that we've barely scratched the surface. Um, and a lot of it is this, um, sort of level setting across centers and within centers about what is good practice at each step of the research data life cycle to be able to capture the real value of data uh, as an asset. And um, so I, I don't think we're there yet, but I, but I think we're making some good progress.
and I'm happy to have a DG ask that question because we'll we'll ask you to to continue to be a champion for that here at Icosan. Yeah, and actually in the larger system. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow on from that because I, I like talking about the CGIR as a billion dollar or a year or investment, and that's what it is. And the, the big data platform, the excellence in breeding, the gene banks, uh, they're all about leveraging that full resource and, and trying to overcome the inefficiencies of 15 organisations making up, you know, departments, institutes making up that billion dollar investment. And, and so you've got to, you know, you have a, a really noble task to be able to drive that forward and ask the hard questions. If you if you're only scratching the surface today and in two years you're very optimistic, you've got to ask, well, you know, what are the barriers to getting there? And that comes back to Hans's point about what are the barriers, what are the enablers to be able to bring around a, a digital transformation in a, in a systems organisation like the CGIR. It's a big task, but that's the job you've got. Other questions? Hans, I'll, I'll follow on. No one else has got any questions? Um, and you'll get this when you interview me too, and Brian's sick of hearing me say this, but so much of the conversation and presentations around digital is around the technology and the transformation on people's behaviour, and yet almost nothing in those presentations talk about the uh, the cognitive process of people, the social science dimension. It's all about the technology going to impact on you, the people and the organisations, but almost no investment in understanding how people behave, how do they live their lives, how they're going to utilise um, you know, these new tools, and what's worked and what's not. It's not like digital has just come this last year. You know, it's come from the 1970s and 80s, we've had these transformational uh, tools available and people are still living their lives today. So my question back to you is where does that fit into understanding digital transformation and we'll follow up that in our, as we discuss it further. Yeah, really good point and I, I tried to, to touch upon it a, a couple of times with my initial uh, slide about the, the headlines, right? And what I'm trying to say it's not a digital transformation that we are doing here as an organization or need to do here as an organization. It's something that's happening within society. So 10 years ago, you would not all be looking on your phones uh, you know, five times in the last hour, probably. And a lot of changes in everyone's kind of um, perception on how society works, the kind of expectations that you have from organizations um, is completely changing. So that's happening whether we, we like it or not. But I think that that's one part of it. Then kind of the other part of it is, you know, what, what kind of cognitive processes should you change in your organization, which is a very important one. And I think you could say the same what I said for leadership, right? It's very, um, it's, it's a very difficult question to say, should we then upskill everyone in all of these technologies? No, um, but you should get everyone to a certain level, level that they understand these technologies. Is it only about technologies again? No. Um, Maybe I can give you an example of uh, a roadmap that I recently set up with Planet International, a large um, development organization. So the four main things in there, data was one, um, um, technology was one, third one I'm not forgetting, but the fourth one was digital DNA, saying what is our, let's say, vision as an organization for bringing digital into our organization. So. Um, and, and that was really a bottom-up approach, saying, how do we feel as, as all employees that are working here, how can digital impact what we're doing? And how we, are we changing the way that we're looking at things, so really disrupting those kind of orthodoxies that we have as an organization, how we approached problems before, how can we change that? How, we will, how will we approach problems now? So that goes back in a lot of small things, for instance, Almost every organization has a 10-step process on how do we set up a project. So there needs, need that, those kind of processes need to change, bringing in and embedding, thinking about how you can do things in a more digital way. I hope that answers your question. Uh, it's the start of a debate, I think. Yeah, yeah. I want to add that, um, you know, the practice of, um, 
you know, developing digital services and tools and services has evolved and improved a lot over even just the last five years. I think it's pretty standard practice now that you would talk about personas of users, personas of stakeholders that you would use as the lens in on this whole set of things. Um, and it's very standard practice now that you would do really in-depth user-centered design around tools uh, and solutions. And I think the reason that is is for the, exactly the things that you're saying about is there was uh, uh, irrational exuberance was a term they used in the, the you know the dot-com bubble. Um, and that irrational exuberance extended to and continues to kind of float around digital tools and technologies. And I think that the hard lessons have been that you have to work from personas of real people to that you're designing for, and then you need to work with actual people that you aspire to be useful uh, to <laughs> in terms of designing um, products and services. Yeah, I was just going to say um, I went to ICT for D a few weeks ago in um, Kampala, and I was with the digital ag team. And there was all lots of modern, cool people from NGOs and so forth, all talking about digital. But uh, there was a survey on on how the partners, so the people from developing world and the, our partners in the NARES are, use, are using these tools, and it was very low. It was less than 10 or 15 percent. So I think we have to bring these people along with us if we're trying to, to digitize. That's one thing. The second thing is uh, when we talk about open data, there seems to be more of talk about open data and making everything open than what you actually do with the data. And so that what, that worries me a little bit. I think we should be focusing firstly on how you manage the data, how you use the data and get insights, and then making it open. Yeah. We have to start somewhere. So in the sense of with the open data, so I mean specifically what, what Big Data Platform is invested in, and this is built on investments under the uh, data and Information Managers Group over the last several years is standardizing the metadata, how, metadata, how we describe the data, so that then those can then map to reference data uh, ontologies and vocabularies, so that we can extract the value from the data that we are generating. And like I said at one point in there, it doesn't always mean that everything absolutely needs to be open immediately and all the time. But we have these tools for being able to, to do more and more sophisticated sort of queries of the data that we're generating. So a couple of different research teams at different parts of the world may not even be, need to be actively collaborating with each other. But if they're describing their data in a way that, that enables that interoperability, you could do queries that actually run across the data generated from all of those. Um, and it doesn't, it could be open or it could not be open. Um, but it's that particular capability that we're trying to capture um, and demonstrate. Under the big data platform specifically, um, you know, we put the infrastructure in place where needed if there were any gaps in terms of updating software or in some cases uh, centers brought in consultants or whatever to just curate some data and put them in open repositories um, without really prescribing what kind of data in hopes that we'll be able to start demonstrating some of those really interesting cross-center queries to show what those capabilities look like. Um, which I guess you might say is a bit cart before the horse, but it's sort of, you know, I think we know we need the cart and we need the horse. So. To add to that, like, so in this line, uh, because we have been seeing interoperability and fairness of the data, a major challenge and a big opportunity also from past couple of years. So most of our data management systems are actually now API based and with the proper metadata. So that kind of things is, is becoming a reality where you can run a cross query and uh, without much human intervention, just use of computer science. So that, when you, so yeah, due to support of all of you, like we have very good fair. Um, I think I don't know if we search in Guardian. I think such data sets will be quite high number with a very good fair score. They will be there. And maybe to get back to your first point, I think maybe after that. We, we need to close. I don't know. I don't want to burden people uh, to go over time too much. But that is a very interesting point, right? Are we? Can we leverage the digital technologies to reach out to more people, or are we creating a divide that's even bigger because that group cannot use certain technologies? And it really connects to the point of human-centered design, 
it's so extremely difficult to come up with a solution that's actually accepted by beneficiaries and actually use. If you go to farmers, they'll show you probably 20 apps that they're using or not using or have been pushed to use and maybe one is successful. So, you know, as a hint for the workshop tomorrow, creating an app for something is not necessarily uh, a good solution for a problem. It's really about making sure that you, you create, a, create a solution that's almost co-created with the beneficiary so you don't enlarge that divide and only use technologies that they're able to use. So you're right. Yeah, thanks for the nice presentation and uh, the talk. Uh, I'm going to ask this question, you know, in the interest of our staff. You know, any public data, particularly big data like this, you know, when open to everybody, uh, can lead to some risk, you know, risk in the sense uh, that can be misused or that can be commercialized, you know, by making bulk downloadings. One of, one of the slides you have shown is more appropriate, a farmer taking a picture, you know. What kind of measures do we have, you know, to control, you know, this kind of commercial use or misuse? That's, yeah, that's a great question and an observation. Um, with regard to, well, first of all, nothing that would be personally identifiable information should ever go into an open repository, and that would obviously be name, address, um, latitude, longitude of a farm, phone number, um, these kinds of things shouldn't go into an open data set. Um, we, 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 um, had some nice collaboration with ICRASAT around developing machine learning approaches to be able to sort of detect that stuff if they do happen to appear in open repositories. And so, um, you know, that's one of the, the kind of services or collaborations that we have on offer with centers um, to, to avert that. And, and I think that the stakes are getting higher uh, because the sort of predatory behaviors are out there, you know. Um, there was one center that we worked with that um, had a bunch of open geospatial, a bunch of imagery, um, and they learned that somebody was looking at the imagery, determining when the truck was on the farm, and then going and stealing the truck. You know, I mean, this kind of stuff. And so we're going to continually find new ways that these data could potentially cause harm, and we have to be very sort of, you know, attuned uh, to that. But um, I think that the, you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, the various definitions of personally identifiable information seem to be pretty good ones and pretty serviceable ones about what shouldn't be out in fully open uh, data sets. So if you're going to be having like lat latitude, longitude of farms, you should probably be restricting that data set to legitimate research uses um, by people you know. Um, uh, if you're going to publish a, a public data set that, that has that underlying data that, that went into it, you could sort of make that known, but not actually release. You'd have to obfuscate it um, a little bit. Um, but it's, a, it's I mean, the, the, the threats continue to evolve, and the ethical frameworks about how to behave um, with these kinds of data uh, have to, are evolving with them. Um, so anyway, great observation. And to add to further to this uh, important question, all of the human subject data in an in, in set is uh, only metadata is public, the data is protected. We have started, uh, whenever somebody requests, we indeed try to approach to the correct scientist and institute. Uh, if they are available who actually collected or the related scientist in socioeconomic, like we all the time ask to the respective colleague and then they talk to the scientist who, have requ who are requesting for the data and if the cause is fine because it's for research and then we, but yeah, so that's why we logged all of human subject data for attic reset. But trial data, et cetera, like we have made them public. More, not much with the geospatial thing. But yeah, like this thing is being discussed. And uh, that's a, like Globus, what uh, Brian has shown. We have been in touch with a couple of more platforms where things can be enforced, so security things, and then assess, uh, assessing data securely and using has been uh, like this thing, right? Thanks, thanks for that. Okay, any last question? <laughs> yeah.
If no last question, thank you very much for coming. And tomorrow we are running 8.30 a workshop. I have sent an invite to many of you. Uh, there we will try to do some digital transformation, assess how we can move forward, what are the low-hanging goals, how we need to move.